Oh, my name is Dan Skip Allen, and this is episode two of season two of the 52 must-see movies and why they matter. And this is, like I said, in part one, we got part one, The Godfather, part two, The Godfather, part two, but also part one, episode one, episode two, because this is a two-part episode, and I wanted to do it as a two-part episode. And once again with me is Mr. Jeremy Adams. Welcome back, my friend. So glad to be back. We happen to be talking about my favorite movie today. So I'm, you better believe I'm very happy. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it's up there right now with, you know, I, I put it at one, two, three in there. I, I can't <laughs> like, I don't think I have a three on my list of top 10 movies. Yeah. There is no three because number two is a tie between the Godfather and the Godfather part two. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's allowed or not, but uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about The Godfather uh, Part 2. We, 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 we went off and did The Godfather Part 1 in Episode 1. Now we're doing The Godfather Part 2 in Episode 2. Uh, the cast is pretty much the same, except you replace James Kahn's Sonny Corleone and Abe Vigoda and um, a couple characters with Mr. Robert De Niro, my favorite actor of all time. and But he's in a separate storyline yeah al pacino michael corleone is in his storyline and that's what's interesting about this film that's different than the godfather is you have two paralleling storylines the first storyline takes starts out in 1901 then goes to 1917 and then michael's storyline starts out in 1958 so um just like the movie we're gonna start out in 1901, um, yeah. where we have the Godfather is a film. Um, I'm a, there was a there was like a um, some dialogue at the beginning, not really dialogue, but some script like a, a crawl. Mm -hmm. You know, in Star Wars they have the crawls. Yeah. It was kind of like a crawl, and part of the crawl was um, Vito Andolini, or Vito Corleone was born yeah. Vito Andolini yeah. um, in Corleone, Sicily. Now we know how he got his name. He changes yeah. from Andolini to Corleone. And they'll give, they'll give us that direct scene later on. And I just yeah. wanted to say real quick, all of these scenes with Robert De Niro's character are in the book, the first book, The Godfather. The, for the first Godfather book gave us all of these scenes, but they didn't include them in the first Godfather film. So one of their starting points for the second film was, well, let's actually do those scenes. And let's use that as a way to give a counterpoint between the father and the son, both as young men. And it was such a genius idea because those scenes are great in the book. And they really gave us so much of the history and the bad, how this man became the man that he is. So really, really great. It's, it's like we get a prequel and a sequel at the same time. So genius <laughs> at the time, something very groundbreaking. It was a phenomenal way of doing the second movie. Yeah. It's like the two movies in, in one movie. You know, and that's yeah. what's amazing about this film. And that's why you have a lot of people saying, oh, is The Godfather Part Two better than The Godfather Part One? But they both are great in their own right. And that's why we're talking oh. about them on this series of films, uh, series you, of. Um, you you got to do something unique when you have a great movie like The Godfather. You got to do something unique with the sequel. I mean, there's no point in just doing a, you know, a, a straight sequel. You got to come up with, especially since that was such an artistic film. And again, Coppola was. He didn't want to make this movie. He never intended to make a sequel. He didn't really, you know, the first one was a work for hire. And he said, first, he had to make a deal with the studio. Okay, let me make this movie. I want to make the conversation and then I'll make The Godfather 2. So first, they had to convince him that way. And then, and then secondly, how am I going to make this artistic? How am I going to find a way in to actually make this? And again, <laughs> he took a work for hire and turned it into one of the greatest artistic achievements of all time with The Godfather. He take, makes the sequel he doesn't want to make and makes a movie that's arguably even better than The Godfather, which seems impossible. And it's like, <laughs> you know, this guy is doing stuff he doesn't want to do and he's given us the greatest art imaginable. It's just always amazing with these films. And then him and uh, Mario Puzo uh, yeah. uh, collaborate on the screenplay in the second Exactly. Film. Yeah, and Pu Puzo, uh, you know, having to basically give write a sequel to his book in this form of this movie. And it, yeah. Yeah, it's so perfect. And um, so going back to uh, Vino Andolini was born in 1901 um, and his brother um, Paolo was killed. And so the mother goes to the gangster 
and she's like begging, please, please don't kill us, please. And um, basically he guns her down and Vito runs. She's like, run, Vito, run. Because Paolo was killed earlier and then Vito has to run off and he escapes all the guys. He's like going to the town and the people in the town is, don't be trying to hide Vito Andalini. We'll, we're going to kill you if you if you hide Vito Andalini. And, you know, we're like, Vito Andalini, it's kind of, you know it's Vito Corleone, but that at that time it's Vito Andalini. He's a little boy. He's Vito Andalini. Yeah. And it's, course, a, it's a great story that he, the, the mob boss, sees him as a threat. He thinks that this family, the Andalini family, could be a threat to his position. And they're going to see by doing this, he actually creates a threat. <laughs> it's a great, great thing that we see in great dramas. People are so, it goes back to Shakespeare, people are so afraid of something, they actually create that thing for themselves. So, it really is. Yeah. Uh, these movies really do have some call, callbacks to Shakespeare. Yes. Typically, this one has a major callback to like Shakespeare because mm. um, Vito escapes and he uh, ends up in Ellis Island. And um, he goes in line. He, you know, <laughs> they evaluate him, and it turns out he's got smallpox, so he's quarantined for three months. But before that, he, the guy goes, "All right, what's your name? What's your name? Your name, Vito. Vito and Vito. the guys, Vito Andolini from Corleone. All right, you're Vito Corleone. How <laughs> <laughs> he gets his name is like, what? What happened to my name? That's not my name. All right, I'm and Vito Corleone." And it's so true because my family actually came through Ellis Island at that same time period. And we don't actually know what our name, I, we believe our name was Adam Shievsky because we we're from Poland. So, but they changed it to Adams because that's what they did. They changed all the names, they Americanized everyone. Or in this case, they just weren't listening to them and they just said the wrong name. And um, you see that a lot, you know, so that, that's another real authentic little historical moment, which the, the history in these movies is always so sound. Yeah, very, very, very accurate. The Godfather yeah. movies are very accurate to the times that they take yeah. place. So then we fast forward to 1958 and <laughs> beautiful, picturesque Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Uh, no. Is it Nevada? Lake yeah. Tahoe? Nevada? Lake Tahoe, that's Nevada. Okay. <laughs> yes, it check is. It. Just check it. Yeah, uh, because basically um, they, you'll see they're, they're a big deal in Las Vegas and, and everything, so they have to make a deal with the senator. So he has to be a Nevada senator. So, yes, it all has to be in, in Nevada, <laughs> as we'll get so, to. So we're at um, we, we're at uh, his, the communion of his son, uh, mm -hmm. Anthony, his son. Um, and then that's where we get to meet your senator that you talk about. Geary. Mr. Geary. Senator <laughs> Geary, portrayed by, because we, we really didn't get into all the cast members, but yes. G.E. Spradlin is the guy's name. And yeah. if you've watched a lot of movies, you've seen this guy. He pops up a lot in the 70s and 80s. Most notably, he's the um, he's the military aide that gives the mission in Apocalypse Now. So another Coppola connection. Yeah, he, he, he's in a bunch of different movies. Yeah. Uh, another great character actor of the time. Um, and he gets up there. Thank you. Vila Corleone. <laughs> oh yeah, gets his name wrong. <laughs> Michael Colleone or whatever. By by the way, in my opinion, not an accident. He did that on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> he mispronounced it on purpose. I think so? Wow, I thought I, think I he... do. I think he did it on purpose because, as you'll see, he's trying to like be superior to these guys. He's looking down at them. They're criminals, you know. And and yeah, that's just a little way of asserting himself, you know, in kind of a shitty way. <laughs> and so then he after he acts like he's his buddy and he gives him this award and blah, 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 blah. He gives him this because Michael gives the, uh, them some money for an endowment or whatever. He basically, we find out the real color, true colors of this guy. He puts a, yeah. tries to put a squeeze on Michael because Michael wants to buy another casino to go with the two casinos he's already got. And he's like, well, it costs, it's $20,000, but you know what? I want you to pay $250,000. And then you're going to give me 5% of everything you make. And Michael's like, uh, this costs $20,000 and you want me to pay that? I wouldn't, first of all, I wouldn't give you a cent over what it's worth, number one. And number two, you know, 
who the heck do you think you are? And he's like, well, I don't like your kind of people. I, I love his counter offer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. He offers them nothing. He says, nothing. No, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you nothing. And, uh, once again, we got these callbacks. I gotta love the callbacks in these movies. The um, script is so good, where these callbacks just are just so perfectly done. Yeah, and there's two of them in this film. There's one in the other film, or yeah. One and this is this is where being where a sequel really benefits because we know what they did to, to the the Hollywood guy in the first movie who wouldn't play ball. What are they going to do to this guy? <laughs> it's like, we're just waiting for it now. Michael's got something up his sleeve. He told him zero. He's going he's gonna to get this guy somehow. So we're, it sets us up for it. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> then we get, we get, we, we meet a character by the name of, um, we, in the uh, conversation, we hear about guys by the name of Johnny Ola and mm -hmm. Hyman Roth. Yes. You know, in some of this conversation that's going on um, and Hyman Roth is a Jew in Miami and Johnny Ola is a guy that works for him. He's kind of like his right-hand yeah. man who kind of does his dirty work for him. But Hyman guy, Roth, by the way, is basically Meyer Lansky, the real oh, life yeah. Jewish gangster. It's what he's modeled after. So it was, you, know, you that was definitely going to end up in the story at some point because Meyer Lansky is such an important figure in all of this. So oh, that's sure. basically who Hyman Roth is. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it's so obvious who 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 he is, and the and that's why, yeah. that's why you know we talk about the accuracy of these films are so accurate. It's amazing how accurate they are to the real life things that are going on and stuff. Um, Mario Puzo, get, give him a lot of credit oh, yeah. for knowing all these details and knowing this mm -hmm. stuff. Put all these things in the script. Uh, we get a, a character by the name of who's kind of drunk, and he's kind of a little. A little pushy, but he pushes his way into the to the whole same thing at the beginning of The Godfather. Hmm. Michael's got to listen to all these people that want to yeah. talk. And uh, Frank Pentangeli. Frank uh, Pentangeli. Frank Pentangeli. He's got his own family in, in Brooklyn. He took over for um, Tessio. He's, yes. He, he ends up living in uh, Vito Corleone's house. Uh, which yep. we'll see later the on. Old the old house. The old house. If I if I can just put a little detail in here. So um, this whole part of the story was supposed to be Clemenza. Clemenza. The, everything that happens with Frankie Pentangeli in this movie was supposed to happen with Clemenza. But the actor, um, I'm sorry for getting his name, uh, Richard Castellano, asked for a lot of money for one reason or another. So they're like, well, we're not going to pay him that. So they basically came up with this whole thing that he, like Clemenza, dies between films. And they came up with this other character, Frankie Pentangeli, who's another, like, that wing of the family. And they brought him in. And uh, I actually think maybe it works a little better because – the the character this goes to this, there's some dark things that happen with this character and I think we had such a connection to Clemenza in the first film that I think it makes it works a little better to have this character we don't quite have the same connection with because you know we're not sure about his loyalty through a lot of the movie and some dark stuff happens so I think that actually benefited the movies it's one of those behind the scenes things that actually works to make the movie even a little better <laughs> yeah, kind of like your uh, your um, um... Roadie Rhodes and Iron Man yep. to Iron Man 2. Don Cheadle, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's basically yeah. the same character with different char characters, but yeah. because like... I like, I like that they didn't recast Clemenza, though. I think that was really smart. You know, they came with a new character. I think, you know, the just do oh, let's just recast him. You know, they did this again. Sorry to talk about Godfather 3, but they, they wrote out um, Tom Hagen and wrote in another uh, lawyer in the third movie, which didn't work as well because you can't replace Tom Hagen. But in this case, it, it benefits the movie. And I think it's, it's a nice little behind the scenes thing to see, you know, what, how, how you can make a problem work to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And uh, he's basically saying these two brothers are trying to muscle in on him, but the two brothers work for Hyman Roth, and he doesn't yeah. want – Michael doesn't want Frank to touch them because he's got dealings with Hyman Roth. And so he gets – he leaves. He gets all upset, and he leaves. And then the next thing we know is Kay's in bed. Michael's in the bedroom. The blinds are open, and she says, why are the blinds open? And Michael looks out the blinds, and he looks down. And he says, get down, and he gets down, and bam, bullets come flying through the, so, the window. So, um, so, so incredible scene. The, what a way to kick this this thing into motion, man. Like, I know. You know. 
it, and it we're is setting a- we're setting up a couple of the other greatest lines we're getting to some other lines of dialogue that are going to come out of this <laughs> yeah um then we're going to go back in time again Oh. We're going to go back to... Yeah, uh, that's a great cut. The way that they cut back at that moment is really awesome. I love the intercutting between the old and the new story because it's like, ooh, what's going to happen next? Oh, let's go back to Vito. And I, I love that like it, because it, it's just an interesting way to break the tension, to, to kind of to set that aside for later, but we're still waiting for it. But then, But this story, the Dear Nero story, is so fascinating too. It's not like we're ever pissed off or like, Oh, I don't care about like we're just as engrossed in the old story. It's just such amazing filmmaking. It really is. I mean, you're you're just like glued to the screen on both of these stories because you're like, oh my god, okay. And then they cut, and then you got to yeah. go back. To the story. And I honestly think it's why the movie is like almost three and a half hours long, and it goes so fast because the intercutting really helps with that. It really keeps you engrossed, and you don't realize how much time's passing. But just the eloquent way that the the story is told, it makes it so. In, like it just makes it move in a weird way even though it's a slow film they're both slow films it moves because of the way that they tell the story oh yeah oh yeah uh, so we're at the opera and um at this point it's robert de niro he's older and it, we're in yeah. 1917 and they're at the opera one of his buddies is there's like, hey you gotta see this girl that's in the opera and so forth and a guy stands up in front of him and he's like hey get out of the way get out of the way <laughs> turns out to be don finucci and Don, at the time, Finucci. Don Finucci is the, the bad guy. He's the main man yeah. of the town. He's the neighborhood boss. He's the Don. And everybody kicks back to him. And if you don't kick back to him, you're in trouble. And yep. some people haven't been kicking back when they were supposed to. So they call him the black hand. Yep. Or he worked for the black hand. I don't know. Um, such a great – that guy's such a great sleaze bag. <laughs> and I just want to mention something I, I meant to mention when we were talking about The Godfather that is even more prominent here is that a lot of the films are in actual Italian where actors are actually speaking Italian. It's subtitled on screen, which was a new thing in mainstream American cinema at this time. It's another thing that Coppola had to fight for you know, because usually they would just have people speaking English and we – we understand they're speaking Italian, but we're actually seeing them speak English. And Coppola wasn't going to do do that. Like he was going to take sure like these this these are Italian films in a lot of ways, and we're going to have them speaking Italian. And that it worked great. Like when when Michael goes back to Italy in the first film, and the moments that Brando spoke Italian. But in this, it's essential to creating this immigrant story of young Vito and the local Don and everything. Like these are basically they they're creating their own little Italian italy here in new york and uh that that was really important for the filmmaking really groundbreaking now it's something we take for granted like some tv shows and movies we watch today like there'll be subtitle sections there'll be people speaking other languages but back then that wasn't done that was you know and this is this 70s were such a time of of doing groundbreaking things and moving cinema forward in so many ways yeah absolutely right. i agree that the, the the subtitles were great in this yeah of the people speaking the Italian because you felt like that was right. They should have been speaking Italian, you know? And they never cheat in these movies. Like, when they speak English, we believe they're speaking English. When they speak Italian, we believe they're speaking Italian. And it's like, like, I just watched today Black Panther and it's like, well, why are they not, why are they speaking African a couple times, but then they're speaking English to each other all the time? Like, they cheat. Like, movies cheat. The Godfather films don't cheat. When no. they speak Italian, they speak Italian and we, and we believe it every step of the way. It's so authentic. Everything's so authentic. Yeah. And, um, of course, they tell the guy, the guy looks back and it's Finucci. And then they go and um, he's just kind of with his wife in his, in his uh, apartment or whether, and a guy like knocks on his window and, it, and he's like, he opens his window and the guy says, here, take this. And he takes it. He looks in it. It's a bag of guns and he hides hmm. it. <laughs> and, and we find out late that who the guy is. Who the guy is. It's Clemenza. It's Clemenza. <laughs> Young Clemenza. Yeah. Hey, so, we didn't get him in the movie, but we got him in the movie anyway. <laughs> yeah, we got so Young genius. Clemenza. And, and, uh, is, yeah, and uh, tell him who the actor is. <laughs> oh, God. You know, that it's, actor, I did not write his name. It's out. the great Bruno Kirby, the comedic actor who was in City Slickers in so many movies in the 90s, unfortunately died young. But yeah, this was one of his first films. And he's, yeah, the, he's great. Uh, the, to see somebody like that, who I've loved in so many films, to go back and see him in The Godfather too is so cool. And he's yeah, so great in the movie. He's really good. At, he's really good yeah. in that role. Um, and so he gets the bag of guns and then um, then he's like, hey man, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Uh, you know, do me the favor by taking the guns. 
I, I know a guy who's got a car, a, a, a rug. You, <laughs> d- does your wife need a rug? And he's like, well, I guess. So they go, to, they go break it into this guy. Uh, <laughs> this guy's your friend. He goes, yeah, it's I, like a rich, rich person's house. <laughs> and so, and he, takes the, he takes the car <laughs> and then they have to sneak out of the house because I guess police come to the house. Out, and then they end up, you know, the police leave and they take off. You see him walking down the street with this car. <laughs> and it's like 1917, I guess you can get away with this kind of stuff. But uh, and- it's kind of, it kind of a funny scene. And again, like my own theories come in. Like I think Vito knew all along what was going on, but he kind of like plays innocent. And uh, we're seeing him kind of tiptoe into this life of crime in a certain way. And it's 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 very funny and and very kind of unique the way that we see this little progression. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And now we're back in 1958, but now we're in Miami, sunny mm. Miami, my state that I'm in. And let me tell you, Miami's beautiful at that time in history. Now, oh you know, yeah. Oh, really? no. I still need to go. I've still haven't been to Miami. I've been to my Orlando a lot of times. Still haven't been to Miami. <laughs> uh, so we're in Miami, and uh, one of the most famous scenes in movie history. Once again, The Godfather's got so many great mm-hmm. quotes. He meets up with Hyman Roth, and uh, they're talking, and he, he kind of basically lies to him, and he says that uh, Frank Pentangeli tried to assassinate he tells him the whole story and then he um talks to him and then that's when the line comes out keep your friends close and your enemies closer yeah and uh, that's yeah. my favorite my favorite line in the entire saga you know i mean there's so many great ones but that one to me is that's the line and then I, I just wanted to jump back just a second. The other great line that I was alluding to earlier is that after the shooting uh, in his bedroom, he screams, you know, about this in my bed where my wife and my children sleep. Like they struck me there. So we know this is all going to be a little more personal for Michael this time. And it's like he's been personal, personally been wronged. And we kind of see where he's coming from in this story. So, yeah, so, so much great dialogue. And that's where I bring up. You know, there's a traitor in the family. You know, yeah. he says, I know I know there's a traitor in the family. Yep, that's yes. And, and gotta and, flush out the rat. Yeah, and then um then he goes back to F- Frank Pentangeli's house, which was his father's house mm-hmm. in New York, and he basically does the same thing. He plays good cop, bad cop with these guys. He's Hyman Roth, he blames Frank Pentangeli, mm-hmm. and with Frank Pentangeli, he blames Hyman Roth. You know, he's and so we we don't at this point we don't know who exactly yeah. did the assassination attempt, but it, he's. It trying. seems pretty clear that uh, that it's Roth and that Pentangeli. He's confiding in Pentangeli, but you know we never we don't know a hundred percent. And then you'll something else happens soon after with Pentangeli that puts everything more in question. So, <laughs> and so um, then here's our one of our callbacks. We just go to uh, Tom Hagen, and he gets called into this sauna that is run by Fredo. <laughs> uh, our friendly Senator Geary is caught. Uh, somebody ends up dying. A hooker ends it's up a, dying. Prostitute, yeah. <laughs> dead prostitute, yeah. He's like, I don't know what's going on. I, 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 was, I, I fell asleep. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. So this is when we get our whole – Call back to where now we can use Senator Geary. There's the horse head moment, <laughs> the dead hooker. <laughs> and um, so Senator Geary then has, we're going to bring you back to Michael's house in Utah, um, uh, uh, Lake Tahoe, and we're going to let you stay there. And then we'll, when we're ready, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll take care of this. Everything will be fine. We're lucky it's at Fredo's place. We can, yeah. we can, you know, smooth things over. And then now, we're in Cuba mm-hmm. and in Cuba, we have something going on in Cuba at this time, Jeremy, it's called the revolution, the revolution, <laughs> more, more very accurate history. Just to, to kind of play into the story here. Please. We had, we had the coming of heroin into, in, in the U S in the first film. And on this film, we get the revolution in Cuba. So it's like there, and there's so much that, plays in so wonderfully in these films like they're not like i said in the first movie they're just making crap up they're folding in history in really ways that that really work and move the story forward and give it more legitimacy and more more depth 
And and one of those things is Hyman Roth asks where the two million dollars is to pay off the Cuban government. Mm -hmm. And what do you know? Next scene, Fredo's getting off the airplane, being picked up, coming into the hotel. He's got a bag with him. The, the bellboy tries to take. He said, "No, no, no, you're not taking that bag." That's, because we know what that bag is. That's $2 million. Somehow mm. or other, Hyman Roth knows he's got the $2 million. <laughs> he's got s snitches or I don't know what's going on. He's like, uh, <laughs> something tells me Fredo just got off an airplane with $2 million. I'm like, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, just real quick, I just want to talk, because we didn't get to it yet. I got to talk about Lee Strasberg, who plays Hyman Roth. Uh, he was the, one of the most famous acting teachers of all time he he was part of the method uh in the actor's studio in the 40s and 50s he you know taught marlon brando and all these great actors james dean and everybody and uh later in life he started acting more appearing in more roles in the 70s and stuff and to me L hyman roth is one of the greatest villains in movie history i think he's fantastic such a great like uh you wouldn't expect it. he's this little mild old man who's a uh, hypochondriac and thinks he's going to die and thinks he's sick all the time. And th that little man to be the, 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 the criminal uh, force That's that he fun. is and the terrifying character that he is in some ways. And what a, what a great actor, Strasberg, what, what an acting legacy there. So I just had to give him a mention real quick. One of the reasons that I love this film so much in particular, for sure. Oh, absolutely. He's, he's fantastic in this film. Yeah. He, you know, he, we, we get his birthday cake party and then we get, we get mm -hmm. um, Fredo, Fredo, and them takes takes them to some kind of a, a dance, some kind. I don't know what the heck kind of dance club this is. Um, and then yeah. you know, and they and I lo I love that he lives in a little like bungalow. This guy's like endlessly wealthy, and he lives in this little place. You know, that just says a lot about his character. He doesn't want to get caught with any of the money. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and um, and then. Fredo, we start figuring things out with old Fredo. I hate to say it, but uh, Michael introduces him to Johnny Ola that are at a they're at a yeah. nightclub. Then they then they go to this kind of weird dance club or whatever the heck it was. Oh yeah, yeah, that scene. <laughs> um, and live sex, um, live sex show. <laughs> yeah, live sex show. And he, when he's at the other nightclub, he says this is the first time he met Johnny Ola. But when he's at that sex show club, he says, yeah, yeah. I, I found out about this because Johnny Ola told me about this the last time we were yep. here. And then he's Michael's an looking idiot. over. And Michael's looking over. He's like, oh, he found out who the traitor was right then and there. He looks back at his guy, his assassin, who he, who's been in all these scenes. He's in black, dressed in black. And um, so the first thing he does is he has to go out and get Johnny Ola. And so yeah. he ends up. I'm sorry, just another quick little mention. The actor who plays Johnny Ola is G Uncle Junior in The Sopranos. So you get a little connection of Sopranos tying back to The Godfather. I always love that. So, yeah. Absolutely. These great actors that come in and out. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned it because, I, like I said, I, I got the cast. But I, yeah. I, was, this one had a lot more um, kind of uh, uh, supporting cast members than the other Godfather. So I, yeah. I, I didn't get all of these guys written down when I was uh, writing my notes and stuff. But yeah. John, and I, 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 to me, like the Sopranos is like the second greatest crime story next to, to the uh, Godfather. So I always love when they have those kids, like that's one of the connections between the two that I love. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a the connection to the good, good fellows also yeah. um, with, um, with um, Vito Corleone's buddy yep. at the beginning. At the, yes. When they first get to 1917, his buddy who's in Goodfellas. Yeah, he is. And, yeah, like out the eyebrows. <laughs> you know, he up, it hung on a hook in a truck, in an ice That's truck. That's true. Yep. <laughs> so, that, so they got keys to are they, these movies. Yep. All these movies all have like ties to one another. All these kinds of films have ties to one or shows yep. have ties. All right. So then um, once we get. Johnny Ola has been killed. Um, we're in this like uh, New Year's Eve party, and um, basically, Michael finally comes up to Fredo and he says, "I knew it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart." And Fredo's like, "Oh my god!" And he kind of he has to like get out of there. He he kind of he kind of has to like stay away from. Um, 
Michael at that point because he knows Michael found him out. And yeah. he's like trying to get away from him and ends up, they both end up escaping because yeah, that's while what the, the revolution. revolution. Yeah. Which, but by they the both, way, Michael saw it coming. No one, he knew this was going to happen and he, and he, t- he was going to pull out of the deal because of this. Um, yeah. Just a quick little thing in high school history class, my high school history teacher uh, talked about this scene and like talked about, um, he actually recounted this whole scene with Al Pacino talking about how he knew the revolutions, the revolutionaries were going to win because the guy blows himself up and he doesn't care, cares about the cause and they, he, they care about it more than the government does. So, you know, it's just, it just shows you how much legacy and how much richness this movie has that they would talk about it in, in classes. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That scene that when the guy blows himself up. Yeah. And, yeah. That's what real, you know, you, we assume we're seeing it today with the Taliban and yeah. And, and, type of people they'll, it's hard they'll to kill that because they they'll kill themselves one of them if they can get three thousand of us or a hundred of us mm-hmm. or two hundred of us to them that's they're winning you know yeah and it, it's just i don't even want to get into it but uh yeah. then we're gonna f- go back in time again <laughs> um so f- don finucci catches on that Vito. And Castellano and all these guys are got their own kind of little racket going, stealing stuff. And he's like, "Well, you know what, guys? This is my neighborhood. I want, I want some of the money. I want some of the kickback." So he goes to his buddies and says, "Guys, he wants such and such money, but you know, this is what you do. You just give me fifty bucks a piece. Instead of giving him two hundred bucks a piece, I'm just going to give him fifty bucks a piece, and I'm going to make, I'm going to make sure he takes the deal." And so that's he convinces his guys. They're like, "Oh, come on! You're they're eating their bowl of spaghetti," and they're mm. like, "Yeah, you know, you don't know what you're <laughs> talking." About. But he's yep. been finally he's been looking at things, he's been watching, he's been doing things. He, he kind of has an idea of what to do then by that point. And um, what he does is he he gives them the money. There's a fair, there's like a parade going on or whatever, and there's a lot of noise going on. And he he gives them the money and he says, "Hey, this is all I got. We can't." Da, 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 this is you're gonna have to take it. And unbelievable, Don Finucci takes it because he thinks he's got a lot of moxie, he's got a lot of spunk. He's like, all right, kid, all right, I'll take it. And then uh he follows him. He he follows along such with a good scene. While well, there's a, a Catholic festival going on. Oh man, it's such great filmmaking. One of my favorite tracking shots in cinema. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my god, what a great scene. And he uh he follows him to his apartment. He opens the door. He, says, he sees him. He says, hey. And then, boom, he, he kills him. The the Take, way that he has the gun wrapped in the towel. The to towel, yeah. Him, but, uh, that, I always love that detail. <laughs> you know, he's the, back. So, Vito, always so smart. <laughs> yeah, well, there was noise in the, from the, the parade and stuff like yeah, that. So yeah, it kind of blends him. Yeah, he uses that to his advantage, too. I also love when he when he uh, unloosens the light bulbs in the hallway so Finucci won't see him coming. Like, the, all those great little details. Yeah, oh, uh, that was really a good, you know, because yeah. then he could hide. He could hide so he wouldn't see him. And then uh, he takes the money back and, you know, and he and he takes the gun. He breaks the gun, breaks it out to pieces, puts it down. Pieces yeah, the chimneys, yeah. <laughs> so it would burn the pieces of the gun or anything <laughs> or anything on the gun or whatever. But um, so then um, fast forward, we're, we're moving really fast now. We're going back to 1958. Come to find out Frank Pentangelo did not get assassinated. Mm-hmm. He did not get assassinated. And he's in protective custody from the FBI. Yep. Um, and this leads us into a government hearing of organized crime. And we get Willie Chichi is the first witness. Yeah. This is because Frank, um, uh, Senator Geary gets wrapped up in all this government stuff about the stuff that's going on with Hyman Roth and in Cuba and all that stuff. So they end up with this hearing and then Michael gets dragged into this um, hearing and he he pulls a fast one out, and in the hearing, he brings from Italy Frank's brother to the hearing. He never says a word. He sits there, can't speak English. Yeah, doesn't even speak. He looks back. 
And then all the questions that the people are asking him at the hearing, he lies. He says, all this says, I don't know what you're talking. I don't know anything about any Michael Corleone. I mean, I, you know, this, that, and the other. I knew, I knew his father, Vito Corleone, da, 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 da. But I didn't know anything about any kind of crime or any of this or any of that. Yeah. Casinos or any of this stuff. Something about the brother scares Frank Pentangeli. Yep. His um, was- yeah, and it's it's a little ambiguous. Like, are they threatening to kill the brother? Does the brother know some? Is there some history there? Like, it's a little ambiguous, but it just shows the genius of Michael. He knows how to play all the angles. I just wanted real quick, when we're seeing uh, potentially being held by the FBI guys, one of the FBI agents is a Harry Dean Stanton, great great character actor. Another little little cameo like Harry Dean is in so many great things. Unfortunately, we just lost him. I just had to give him a shout out because he's he's one of the uh, FBI guys, and it just shows how so many great actors come in and out and fill these films, fill the fill yeah. out the cast. And I didn't even know that, so that's something yeah. that I learned. <laughs> yeah, no he's in there. If you watch it again, just watch that scene that Harry Dean stands one of the guys. They're like you know chit chatting hanging out with Pentangeli and stuff, wow. the FBI guys, yeah. I had no idea. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so then um, Michael gets some bad news from Tom Hagen. Um, Kay loses the baby. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, Michael, it, he asks Michael. Michael's kind of a little upset at this. He's like, Tom, was it a boy? Well, it's three months old. Was it a boy? And they they don't know. They said I don't I don't know if it was a boy, you know. Um, so he kind he's kind of add this is another callback to later in the film. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna give it away just yet. Um, we're gonna go back in time again, R- Jeremy. We're going back in time again. <laughs> uh, now Vito is the Don, and um, an old lady is talking to his wife, and she talks to him about how she's trying to she rents this apartment and, i'm sorry and by the way he he has uh built ginkgo, ginkgo. olive oil ginkgo. olive oil company which we know from the first film was the front that yeah yeah well, Jim, their business I was to, to actually see him build the first the the location is really cool yeah i was just gonna get to that i just had yeah. got to it <laughs> yeah sorry. but you got to it first you got yeah. to it first <laughs> so, yeah ginkgo olive oil and uh, like i said uh I, this is like the third time I brought up Dave, but I brought I I, I should have bought the Jenko Olive Oil T-shirt. I don't know why I didn't buy one. <laughs> but I guarantee it. If if you walk around with real film fans, they would know what Jenko Olive. But okay. nobody else would know what the hell Jenko Olive Oil is. I Unless, would. <laughs> I mean, yeah, film fans. That's what I'm saying. Well, it's people like, love The Godfather. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you know, I think I'm gonna find that shirt and buy it for my uncle because my uncle lives and breathes the Godfather movies. There is he literally has both the first two films memorized. Like he could say the whole script. (laughs) Godfather is like his life, so that would be a cool thing for somebody like that. Yeah. Um, So then, um, Vito helps the old lady by talking to the landlord and says, "Hey, you know, could you give the lady a break? You know, she." I'll give you some money, this six months rent. Just let her stay here, but keep, let her keep the dog. And he's like, "Oh, I don't want to keep let her keep the dog." That's that I I want. Yeah, it gives him a lot of shit. You know? <laughs> then, um, then basically he's like, "All right, all right, all right." He then, tells him, "Ask around about me, right?" Doesn't he say, "Ask, ask about, say my name to people." He's like, "Oh, whatever, whatever." <laughs> and then you see the guy come back. Yeah, and then he comes back and he's like, "Here, take your money back, and I'll give her." <laughs> don't a give me anything. No money. <laughs> It's free. Yeah. It's free. That's yeah. so great. I, I, I mean, I can't believe it. I mean, Don, Don Corleone. I mean, how, why didn't you say something? You know, and he's like, <laughs> you know, he doesn't say nothing. He just sits there. I mean, literally, he sits there. He doesn't. This guy's like blabbering. Here's your money. All right, I'll give him. I'll give the lady a f- five dollar break. Then he's like looking around. He's looking at his buddy. He's like, All right, I'll give her a ten dollar. Is that fine? He shakes. His <laughs> no, that's right, great. Ten bucks. <laughs> ten bucks break on the rent. That's fine. I mean, he doesn't do anything, and you walk outside yeah. and you see them putting up the sign in the shop, Janko Olive Oil, which, yeah, you know, like we just mentioned, you know. Yes. So, um, and hey, this is this is Don Vito. This is the Don Vito we first met with Brando. He just sits there quietly, you know. He doesn't he doesn't um, overdo anything. He's just quiet, and we're seeing De Niro become that. And it's it, what a genius performance of how he creates his own character with Vito, but at the same time, we're seeing this progression to him becoming that guy. And, and, <laughs> and here's our 
call back to the very beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. he goes back to Corleone, Italy. He goes back to visit the gangster that yeah. killed his mother and his brother. And he's got a buddy with him and they got the can of olive oil. He's mm -hmm. like, Hey, this is the guy we're doing business with in America. This Vito Corleone, da da da. He's like, Hey, what's your name? He's like, Oh, Vito Andalini. And I can't he's, hear you. Come closer. Can't hear you too well. <laughs> he just rips him from Cuts him, yeah. limb to limb with the, with the knife. As we knew why he was going back. We knew what he was going to do. We knew he wanted to get revenge for his mother and his brother, and he did it. And for us, as the viewer watching, we're like, yes. Yeah, I don't care how old that guy was. He deserved it. Yeah. You know, the he gets shot on the – He did it to himself, too. <laughs> he created his own fate. He could have um, had a great ally, really, to yeah. be honest. All yeah, and I, I, a little – another little side detail. Um, De Niro actually had – because in the first film, Brando had a, the, the mouth plate made for the character, this like jowl. He wanted uh, Don Vito to be like a bulldog. So he had like these jowls and they created this denture for him. So at this point in The Godfather 2, as Vito's getting a little older, De Niro had a denture plate made for these last scenes where we could see him start to kind of becoming that character, like a like not as a smaller uh, version of it. And that just shows that's like, if you look, you can see that in those scenes that he's wearing it and that this is, this is him. This is Don Vito. The, the bridge is happening. So that's a nice little detail, uh, particularly in that scene. And um, going back, we're going back to 1958 again. Mm -hmm. And then one of the scenes that I didn't bring up that I'm going to talk about now was, Michael, once Michael knows that Fredo was the traitor, he talked to his guys, his right hand man, one of his hitmen guys. He says, Nothing happens to Fredo while, while our mother is alive. alive. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't you know it? Michael's mother dies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just a little quiet. We also got to talk about Connie in this movie. Early in the movie, Connie is angry and hates. Uh, um, Michael because of the death of her husband and she's like neglecting her kids and she's living like this, this lifestyle with some dude. And then like, she eventually comes into the family and really is kind of a heart of the movie in some ways. And uh, she actually like, pleads for Fredo, makes him take Fredo back. And uh, so that's all, that all kind of happens leading up to this point too. It kind of makes it even more tragic with what ultimately happens. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of overlooked Connie cause I didn't think her, her part of the oh movie. yeah just a, just a little a little mention but yeah it just gives a little humanity you know to like because mike's going to some dark places Kay is in a dark place in this movie and i think connie brings in a little of that heart you know with her transformation like actually coming back to the family yeah she comes back home and she's yeah she, she's a big part of the end of the movie she's a big part mm -hmm. of the end of the movie because she really plays a big part yeah. in the end of this film because she has to do some of the dirty work for michael mm -hmm. um fredo okay fredo's going fishing and um she calls anthony who's going fishing with fredo and there was going to be three of them it was going to be the right hand man of michael it was going to be fredo and it was going to be anthony al yeah. and then she calls him and she says Anthony, Anthony, come on back. Michael, Michael and you have to go to Reno. So that's her way of getting Anthony out of there. So the hit I never thought she knew. I didn't okay. I didn't think she knew what they were gonna do. You think she does? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I always thought they just said, Hey, take the kid. So she I don't think he she knew he was gonna kill uh Fredo. But you know, that's these great movies. You can debate these points. You never yeah. know. It doesn't tell you one way or the other. And uh, you know, and then Frank uh, Frank gets a visit from Tom, and Tom basically tells him the story, this kind oh, of a tragic so story. And uh, great Frank, Robert Duvall moment, yeah. He gets he gets the story. He knows what Tom is saying, without having to do anything. Just About tell him how, the, yeah, oh, in like Greek society or like the old societies, they would take hemlock to kind of have a dignified death. Um, rather than, you know, be arrested or, or probably executed or whatever it is. This is a great speech that he tells, yeah. And um, so we we basically see Fredo go out fishing, get shot by Al Neary's character, the hit, the hitman guy, the buddy. The, and then we, we get Frank. Uh, he ends up cutting his, slicing his wrists, mm -hmm. and he's in his own blade, dies from loss yeah. of blood. 
in the tub in protective custody. And then Hyman Roth, he has nowhere to go. Uh, Israel won't take him. All these countries. He ends up coming back to Miami. And uh, he says, hey, I got to come back to Miami. I got, you know, this is where I live. Da, 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 da. I got to come back. I got all this stuff to do. You know, and one of the reporters is one of the guys that works for Michael. And he yep. basically shoots him and kills him right there, dead on the spot. And he runs away, but then they shoot him. And, yeah, and with all the cops and everything there. That that moment always kind of reminded me of the, the Lee Harvey Oswald shooting. I feel like there might have been a little bit of a – like they're referencing that, like uh, when um, Jack Ruby shot him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so many little historical touches. And then a gr- a really great scene uh, that ends this movie is a um, a dinner scene. Kind of, we get to see some of the characters. We get Carlo. We get Sonny. We get some of these characters. But before you know what, I fast forward too much. Yeah. Before I get to that scene. Uh, we get we get Diane Keaton. Yes. Uh, Kay, we get Kay, and she's like, "Hey, I'm taking the kids with me. I'm taking the kids. We're leaving. We're getting out of here." And he's like, "Kay, what do you who, who do you think I am? What do you think I am? You think I'm just gonna let you take my children? You know, I know you blame me for the death of your baby." And so great. and then she says, "Michael, no, I don't blame you for the death. I killed." our child. I had an abortion. And <laughs> Michael's face was ridiculous. I mean, his it's, eyes were popping out of his it's face. It's one of the few times he actually like goes big in the movies. Like he's so restrained for most of it. This is a scene where Pacino actually loses it. And I think because he's so restrained, it's such a powerful moment of him losing it and like attacking her a little bit. And man, what a moment. And uh, to have an abortion subplot back then, I that was pretty brave for a movie from 74. Um, and it's, it's really one of the more powerful moments. And it, it, she's right. She doesn't want to bring his kid into the world. It almost is like, almost like she's talking about the uh, Rosemary's baby or something <laughs> like, I'm going to bring this evil into the world. Like she's right. And then I think he kind of knows that. And it's so dark and, and such a powerful moment at the end of the story. Yeah. And then, and, and, and he says, I'll never be around you. I'll never be in the same room with you again. Mm-hmm. I'll never. You come over. You tell me a day ahead of time when you're coming here to see the kids, and yeah. or whatever. So you won't he be there. Want to be there. Ever wants to have anything to do with her? And then, and then she ends up showing up at, at the house when he's there. Yeah, and she's like feeling kind of guilty and sad about things. And when he walks up and just looks at her and just closes the door in her face, oh, it's so good. That's a good. Oh my god! And yeah. then Connie, I see Connie's kind of actually raising the kids like more than she is, you yeah. know. So yeah, it's it's fascinating how all that plays out. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. That's where the Connie character really comes back. Yeah. And- you know, with Fredo and dealing with with uh, Kay, those are the mm-hmm. two plot plot details that she really becomes a a, a yeah. very integral part of the story once again. And she basically says, "Michael, you're right. I should have never left. I shouldn't. I should have stayed." And, yeah. and you know, she gives him ba- credibility cre- credit for everything. And she's like, "Wow, mm-hmm. why, why didn't I just listen to you when I had the opportunity?" You know. So now we get to the end of the movie. Is a just a beautiful dinner scene where. Um, yeah, get these characters like Carlo and Sonny who are dead, and we get all these characters. And there's a dinner, and they're waiting for Vito. Uh, it's his, I think it's a birthday party. Yes, yeah, so it's a birthday think, party, and yeah, and I think we'll get into what else is going on. And Abe, 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 um, Abe brings yeah, Abe, uh, Dante, yeah, and then yeah. Um, Tom Hagen. It one by one, the characters start moving away from the, once they all come into the room, they're all in the room. Then one by one, they all leave the room and it's time. And the, and the, uh, the other thing is that uh, we find out this is when uh, uh, Michael had uh, did, uh, enlisted for the service and they're all, what are you doing? You can't go off the war and everything. Like you know, we don't fight their war. Like, so that, you know, that set that whole thing up and this is, they're going to have to tell the dad on his birthday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That that Michael went into uh, went yeah. service in World War Two, mm-hmm. but you know the thing is, if at the beginning of the Godfather, he's still proud of Michael. You know, he's yeah. still proud of his son what for his son's service. But his country isn't his family, and it's it's not mm-hmm. his blood. And that's if if you take away one thing from these movies is mm-hmm. is your family is your blood, you know, and yeah. your blood is everything. The blood of these people is everything. 
to them. And um, when he finds out that it was that Tom and him been talking about his his life and his career, what what they have plans for him, and you you see that kind of where he does have that inside him where he could possibly have a temper and he could yeah. do oh you're going to talk about my life my career my my mm. family. Like, whoa okay here we go <laughs> that was an interesting added thing yeah. to the movie to, to end the movie that way with all yeah. the characters was really a interesting storyline and i personally in terms of the family theme i think the real theme is Vito never lost that. He always knew it was about the family. And I feel like Michael lost it because in trying to protect his family and all this stuff, he lo kind of lost his family and pushed them away and didn't, he didn't have what his father had in some way, even though they're all criminals, like, you know, Vito actually loves his family in a way, but Michael, there's something rotten in Michael there. And we see that that's really the story of these two films. And a little side detail in that scene, Brando was supposed to come back for that scene. Um, and they couldn't, they couldn't get him at the last minute. He backed out. So they kind of orchestrated the scene around him arriving, which was a night. I actually think it kind of helps the scene, makes it even like, you know, we're going to see this guy that we've seen in, in flashback this whole time, but we don't see him. There's something kind of eloquent, eloquent about that that I like. Yeah. How they all leave the room. Yeah. Except Except for Michael. Except Michael, yes. Sitting yeah. there, not talking to his father. You know? yeah. Not being his father. There's some very symbolic there. Yeah, that re really was symbolic. Um, but this is, I mean, these two films, I mean, mm. what, what can I mean? We know they're essential. They won Best Picture. They won yeah. Michael, yeah. My, Robert De Niro won Best Supporting Actor. Michael, um, the, the only character in movie history that two actors won an yes. Oscar for playing the character. Robert De Niro won for playing Vito Corleone in The Godfather Part Two. Marlon Brando won for playing Vito Corleone in The Godfather Part One. Michael yeah. won for Best Actor for playing uh, Michael Corleone right. in Part Two. Did, well, he didn't he win. Didn't, he, he didn't win. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't win for, for Part One, which is strange. No, he I didn't. Mean, he didn't win for either. <laughs> no, he, yeah, whoa. his his first Oscar was for his only Oscar was for Son of a Woman. Yeah, he, he no lost. Way. Yeah, it was actually uh, Art Carney for Harry and Tonto won Best Actor over Al Pacino in oh The Godfather God. 2. But, um, you know, but, you know, the Oscars, but I will say the, uh, the Godfather Part 2 won a lot more Oscars than the first one. I think well, six, and the first one only won three. So, yeah, it just shows you, like, even, even in its time, people appreciated the sequel, like, like, even maybe more so than the original. It's just amazing that a sequel could do this. Um, and, you, you know, it's, you could make the argument it really isn't a sequel, like, it's all one story. And then um, they did um, a cut called The Godfather of the Full Saga, where they actually chronologically put the De Niro stuff first, and the entire story takes place chronologically. They played that on TV a lot. So that, that you know, I think Coppola inv was involved in that. So that's also another way you can kind of look at it. Like, it's this ongoing story and not, you know, the the for the sequel and everything. Like, they really are, like you said, you ranked them together, like, you know, like one piece, and that actually is kind of fair. You could rank them as one, because that's kind of, in a sense, what they are. And Dave, that's what Dave said. That's yeah. His first viewing of the Godfather. He never, he didn't never knew there was another Godfather. Yeah, <laughs> he the Godfather over in England. That's how they they got it over in England. Yeah. Yeah. Part 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 two was intercut into part one and part. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I would have loved to have seen it that way. Yeah, I saw it like a year ago. I finally saw it for the first time, and it is kind of fascinating. Like I was watching with my family. My dad's wife was like, "Wow, I really this is really." cool i love that they did this it, it it is worth watching at least once just to kind of see it that way and again like i said the stuff with de niro was in the book um it was first in the book like that's how the book starts so that's kind of like telling it like the book story yeah that's fantastic i mean these two movies are just phenomenal movies and uh you know just like like you said my list is i have a one and a two and i don't have a three on my favorite top 10 movies yeah. of all time or if i put when i put whatever lists i do i put the godfather godfather part two together yeah. and so i had to do these two episodes of the 52 must see movies and why they matter together because it just you got to do them together you can't talk about one godfather yeah. without talking about the other and they're so inter, yeah. inter, inter integral into each and, other and that's so, a good uh, thing there never was a third one that we have to worry about <laughs> well we don't talk about the third one yeah <laughs> um <laughs>
Yeah, I just want to say I don't know what it is, but I like crime isn't really my main genre. Like I I like all types of movies, but I wouldn't say crime is like my number one genre or anything like that. But for whatever reason, these Godfather One and Godfather Two resonate for me. Like no other movies, they're movies I always come back to. I saw them, you know, I probably saw them when I was like eight for the first time, way too young. But, you know, they've always been there in my life and I always come back to these movies. And to me, two resonates even more than one with the parallel story, with the father-son story, with um, Lee Strasberg and all these great things that they added. And, and it really, I do say it's my favorite movie. I don't even know. It's hard to quantify. Like, why this movie? You know, why isn't it something, you know, like a drama or something that might be more in my wheelhouse? But, it, I mean, it is. It's everything. It's a drama. It's suspense. It's action. It's everything you could want in this great and lots of history like we all talked about like it, the, this these are the movies to me um and they're really for me like even great films that i love like casablanca like citizen king like they just don't resonate like i just don't come back to them the same way i do with the godfather it's just something special about these movies and you know and even coppola like they were movies he made for hire and he made other great films but for whatever reason this is the Coppola. This is like Coppola to Zenith as an artist. And they're just, That's they're very single, singular films. There's just something about them. Yeah, you're out. I mean, you, Jeremy, you know, I knew, you know, I don't know where it was. I, I heard something that you loved The Godfather way, a while ago. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to do The Godfather. I'm going to do The Godfather. I'm gonna I appreciate it. <laughs> Jeremy Adams. There's a lot of other people love these movies, but man, I love these movies. And like I said, my uncle's favorite film. You know, I just, I, I feel honored that I got to talk about these two films today. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is too, was when you, when you know the essential nature of the films, we know mm -hmm. when we're doing this series, we're going to be talking about films that a lot of people love, but, they the 70s weren't a big um decade with the first group of 52 must see movies yeah. and so i really yeah. want to concentrate on what you obviously know by now is my favorite decade of film yeah. that's the 70s uh in the well to some extent the early 80s not the yeah the mid to late 80s i, I don't like as much but the early 80s and the 70s to me is is the greatest decade of film, in my opinion, and I know I'm just one person. So, I, but I grew up with a lot of these films. More I do so. think that I do think the '70s is the greatest era for American cinema, for sure. If you're going to yeah. talk war world cinema, it changes a bit, but for American cinema, I think the '70s is the perfect moment for um, American filmmakers stepping forward, becoming true auteurs, true artists, drawing on things from the past, from other countries, bringing that into. And it's when I said they lifted the. The, um, the movie code so that we could do, you know, we were limited by the the code, the ratings code. Now we could have R rated movies, PG movies and uh, uh, do new things in storytelling. And then um, once kind of the corporate machine kicked in in the eighties, a lot of that went away. A lot of that expression was lost. So I think seventies really is the perfect moment for American cinema in terms of art, the artistry. And, you, you and know, it's the greatest art. I mean, we got Coppola, we got Scorsese, we got Spielberg, we got De Palma. All these great artists, you know, just Lynch. happened to come to get come together. David, yeah, well, yeah, David Lynch at the end of the the decade, Alan. like they just happened to come together. Robert Altman, like uh, one of my favorites, Hal Ashby, like all these great artists just coalesced at the perfect moment. Woody to, Allen to give us, yeah, Alan, yeah, to give us all this great art. Yeah, and that's and, you know, and in these movies, when you put De Niro, Pacino, Brando. You know, yeah. I know it's not it's not comparable, but The Departed mm -hmm. had a phenomenal cast, good fellas, a phenomenal oh, cast. Yeah. So, so you kind of those if you look at the era, the Good Fellas was in the eighties, and The Departed was in the two thousands, and the, the Godfathers were in the seventies. You know, so it did span so many decades. If you look at the three kind of great or four or you know, yeah. arguably four of the greatest gangster films of all time if you really and all think and all thrill sopranos in there from tv from the 90s and 2000s that's it yeah, <laughs> yeah. sopranos had the 90s and the 2000s because it was a tv show and it really was a phenomenal tv show you're absolutely right but uh jeremy this comes to an end of this, yep. this epic two-part episode kicking off <laughs> the season uh second season of the 52 must-see movies and why they matter um where can you be found my friend you can find me at Jeremy Paul Adams on Facebook, Jeremy Paul Adams on YouTube, and I am 
uh, one of the head administrators at Full Metal Media, where season two of this awesome show will be launched. And you can check out our other content. We do talk shows. I do started hosting my own show called Nostalgia Goggles. And then we also do live trivia. So you can check out our live trivia matches. And you can also find me on the Worldwide Movie Games Network, which also has Full Metal matches uh, reposted on there. And they have their own trivia league, which I'm the head question writer on. And then we do movie debating and other things that, that go up on that network as, as well. So check it out and, and you'll see a lot that I'm involved in. My, my mug will pop up a lot. So. <laughs> yeah, and this guy vouch. too. Dan, Dan's great over there. So Yeah, I can vouch for Jeremy. He's everywhere. Um, I'm not as... I'm not as a widely uh, out there. We're getting you there. We're getting you there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can you can find me at Dan Skip Allen on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. If you're interested in uh, season one's episodes of the 52 Must See Movies and Why They Matter, you can go to the Best Damn Movie Show channel. That's where all 52 episodes will be. We will be moving them over to the Full Metal Trivia uh, Media YouTube page, and you can check it um, check these episodes out when. They air on Full Metal um, Media on Facebook as well. So for Jeremy and myself, good night.